You see, really, if you were to reduce all of the questions in the world down to one question, it would simply be this. Uh, did uh, God make man or did man make God? Is, is, uh, is man the special creation of Almighty God or is God in the figment and the imagination of man? Known for his unique ability to simplify profound truth so that it can be applied to everyday life, Adrian Rogers was one of the most effective preachers, respected Bible teachers, and Christian leaders of our time. We hope you'll have your Bibles open as he takes us through today's study. And if you are encouraged by today's message, remember, you can stream this message again and download outlines, notes, a transcript, and other resources to go along with this message, all at lwf.org. Now, let's join Adrian Rogers. I'd like for you to find 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 20. When you found it, would you please look up here? 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 20. I want you to listen as we talk about this subject, evolution, fact, or fiction. You see, really, if you were to reduce all of the questions in the world down to one question, it would simply be this. Uh, did uh, God make man or did man make God? Is, is, uh, is man the special creation of Almighty God or is God in the figment and the imagination of man? Now look at our verse. Uh, second Tim 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20. O Timothy, keep that which is committed unto thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. Now, what are we talking about when we talk about Darwinian evolution? Oh, what is this? Well, let me tell you what is extant, what is out there in the air today, what our students are subjected to uh, day by day and what is found in most all of our libraries. Time Magazine uh, has this advertisement. Actually, the series is called The Emergence of Man, and this series is found in almost all public libraries, in almost all high school and junior high school and elementary schools across America. Let me read from that ad. Let me just show you what children uh, are, are being taught and, and what this is only typical. This is not universal, but I would say it is very typical. I'm reading now from the Time Life book series, The Emergence of Man. Quote, Today, that creature who first began to raise himself above other animals no longer exists. He has become you, unique, set apart from the two million other species living on the planet by a thumb that makes your hand the precision tool by a knee that locks you into a comfortable upright position and by your capacity for abstract thought and speech. Now that's what makes you different, boys and girls, your thumb, your knee, and the ability to think abstractly. That's what makes you uh, a significant other from an animal. All this and more has enabled your species to dominate the earth. And yet you share with every other creature that ever lived the same origin the same accident that led to the spontaneous generation of the first celled slimy algae three and one half billion years ago. Now notice, no stutter, no stammer, <laughs> no, no equivocation. This is it, kids. Uh, thank God for your thumb. Thank God for your knee. Thank God that you can think abstractly because that's all that separates you from everything else that came from slime and they know exactly when it happened. Uh, they, they can give you the date. It happened uh, three and one half billion years ago. Now, if that is true, just right away, if that is true, think what that says, number one, about the value of human life. You're not made in the image of God. Uh, you are simply a creature of accident. What does that have to say about morality? If there is no uh, creator, there's no fixed standard 
of right or wrong. And therefore, if you are an accident, simply akin to other living uh, creatures, and if there is no fixed standard of right or wrong, what does that say about the meaning of life and the purpose of life? Well, let's go back to this article again. They ask, how did it all happen? What was the evolutionary process that led man to his conquest of a harsh and hostile environment? Uh, they, they didn't say, could it have been by evolution? They say, what was the evolutionary process? And then they go on to say, you find the amazing story in Time Life's book's new series, The Emergence of Man. Your introductory volume, The Missing Link, shows stranger than science fiction, the stranger than science fiction world of Australopithecus, the ape man. You will feel a sense of immediacy in visual adventure, in incredible, lifelike, pictorial, technical photo painting. And then they have all these pictures, this, this lifelike, uh, pictorial, technical photo painting. I want you to understand as just another way of saying the figment of someone's imagination. And there are the pictures. And the kids look, wow, it must be real. They've got, they've even got pictures. Well, what is evolution anyway? Uh, uh, it's a theory made popular by Darwin and um, first espoused in his famous volume, uh, or espoused there in his famous volume, the origin of the species. Now let me, let me tell you what Darwin himself said, and I'm quoting on page 23. Analogy would lead me to the belief that all animals and plants are descended from some one prototype. All animals and plants are descended from some one prototype. All organisms start from a common origin and from some low and intermediate forms, both animals and plants may have been developed. All organic things which have ever lived on the earth may be descended by some one primordial form. So what is, what, what does that mean? Well, we all started out somehow as a speck of protoplasm in green algae and ipso facto everything developed out of that. Now, the prime tool is mutation plus natural selection. Mutation means that things just change as they adapt and, and naturally select uh, uh, themselves out of their environment. So they believe that, first of all, there was primitive protozoa. That just simply means original life. And somehow that primitive protozoa became a, an unsegmented worm. And then that unsegmented worm evolved into a fish. And then that fish turned into an amphibian. And that amphibian turned into a reptile. And then the reptiles became birds. And then the birds became mammals. And then finally the mammals became men. Now that's, that's what uh, you're supposed to believe. That nothing plus time plus chance equals everything. That time plus chance turns amoebas into astronauts and molecules into monkeys and men. Now what it is, folks, it's a fairy tale for adults. I mean, in, in, in the nursery school, we, we talk about fairy tales where frogs turn into princes, but uh, we call that a fairy tale. But when we carry it into the classroom, it's the same fairy tale, only now it is for adults. I like Dr. Criswell's little saying that he uses sometimes, once I was a tadpole, beginning to begin. Then I was a frog with my tail tucked in. Then I was a monkey in a banyan tree. And now I am a professor with a PhD. And you just simply uh, go from step to step. Now, I want to tell you why I reject Evolution. I want to give you three reasons why I reject evolution. And I want you to think about these reasons. I don't want to argue with you, but I do want to state them clearly, hopefully that you can understand why many intelligent and well-trained people reject evolution. Now, I do reject evolution, first of all, for logical reasons. 
It is not logical. And many intelligent and well-trained scientists, now listen, I'm not talking about Baptist preachers now. I'm talking about intelligent and well-trained scientists are moving away from evolution because it does not answer the questions. Dr. Newton Tamasian, a physiologist for the Atomic Energy Commission, has stated this, and I quote, Scientists who go about teaching that evolution is a fact of life are great con men, and the story they are telling may be the greatest hoax ever. In explaining evolution, we do not have one iota of fact. Now that's, that's an Atomic Energy Commission scientist. That's not Adrian there. And then uh, a Dr. Etheridge of the British Museum of Science said this. Listen to it. Nine-tenths of the talk of evolution is sheer nonsense, not founded on observation and wholly unsupported by fact. This museum is full of proofs of the utter falsity of their view. Again, that's not uh, some raving religious lunatic who said that. Uh, listen to uh, Dr. Ambrose Fleming. He was president of the Philosophical Society of Great Britain. Here's what he said. The evolution theory is purely the product of the imagination. Again, who is this saying this? These are brilliant men, learned men, men who've been honored. Dr. Cecil Wakeley, leading British surgeon and the late president of the Royal College of Surgeons said this, when I was a medical student, I was taught the theory of evolution, but I never believed it. Now, this is not a six or seven doctor. This is a, a number 10 doctor. Uh, Swedish embryologist Soren Lothrop wrote this, I believe that one day the Darwinian myth will be ranked the greatest deceit in the history of science. When this happens, many people will pose the question, how did this ever happen? Again, we're not talking now about a Bible thumper. We're just talking about a scientist who says, this doesn't make sense. Uh, the great scientists have not all been evolutionists. Michael Faraday, which many acclaim as one of the greatest scientists to ever lived, was a, a Bible-believing Christian. Lord Kelvin, Joseph Lister, Louis Pasteur, Isaac Newton, Kepler, Sir William Ramsey, Lord Francis Bacon, Samuel Morse. These were all creationists. Were they fools? Now, when a scientist says he believes the Bible, it doesn't give me any more faith than the Bible. It just gives me more faith than the scientist. I mean, we don't need science to prop up the Word of God. But what I am saying to you is that logically, uh, you don't have to put your brains behind the door to believe in, in creation, or at least to repudiate evolution. Some have said that Sir Isaac Newton was the greatest scientist of all time. He wrote this, this most beautiful system of sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. Now, I said I reject it for logical reasons. Let me give you four bridges that no evolutionist can cross. Four things that, uh, that uh, the evolutionist has no answer to. And therefore, he should not stand in the school and say, this is fact. The first, uh, the first question the evolutionist has no answer to is, is simply, folks, the origin of life. The origin of life. From whence is life? Now, they've tried to wrestle with this, and one person said, well, perhaps the origin of life is some germ came and hit the earth. It was riding a meteor from outer space. Well, that just moves the question back to where did it begin? Uh, how did it begin in outer space before it came to this earth? But uh, most uh, push that aside is only pushing the question back. And so what the evolutionist has to believe is that life arose by spontaneous generation. That is, that in organic matter, prebiotic soup, green gum, slime, something turned into life. 
It's a, it's what they call a fortuitous concourse of atoms. Now, doesn't that bless you? A, a fortuitous concourse of atoms, a flash of lightning through some kind of green scum. Now, let me tell you something, folks. Evolution is a philosophy. It is a bias. It is the next best guess of the mind that cannot accept God. D. M. S. Watson, a scientist, displayed his prejudice when he wrote, Evolution is a theory universally accepted not because it can be proved by logical, coherent evidence to be true, but because the only alternative, special creation, is clearly incredible. He said, I, I, I believe in evolution, not because I can prove it. No, I just cannot believe there's a God who did it all. Folks, you see, it's a philosophy. It's a philosophy. Spontaneous generation, that was believed by ignorant people 2,000 years ago. They would see some refuse, some, some dung, some carrying, and after a while they would see maggots come out and they would say, would you see that? Life has arisen spontaneously. They would see some, some uh, uh, rags that had been wrapping cheese and after a while there would be mice there and they would say, you see that? <laughs> That's where life comes from. But then Pasteur and others said, no, that's impossible. And every scientist knows that spontaneous generation is impossible. And there's no answer. There is no answer as for the creation of life apart from the act of God. Now, here's, here's another, here's another uh, problem, a logical problem that every evolutionist has, and that is the fixity of the species. The fixity of the species. The idea that uh, one species can become another. Now, what does the Bible have to say? Genesis chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, God says, says this, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, and the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit, now listen to this phrase, after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. What is the key word there? After its kind, after its kind, after its kind. And as you read Genesis, this little phrase uh, uh, occurs ten times. Now, be very careful here. We certainly believe that there can be varieties within species. You can have all kinds of roses. Uh, you can have all kinds of felines. You can have all kinds of canines. You can breed and crossbreed, but you cannot turn a cantaloupe into a kitten. You just can't do that. Uh, you cannot go from one species uh, to another. I heard about a marine biologist who thought he would take that beautiful shell animal there on the west coast, a an abalone, and somehow mix that with a crocodile. He, all, he even had a name for it. It was going to be an abadile. But he turned up with a crock of baloney. <laughs> you cannot, you cannot mix these species. Now, if, if, there, if there was a, these transitional forms, if, 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 if uh, these, these um, uh, primitive protozoa became unsegmented worms and these unsegmented worms became fish and reptiles and on and on and on, you would expect to find the fossil remains. Now, folks, it's not that we don't have fossils. We've got billions of fossils, billions of fossils. In not one will you find a legitimate transitional form. Not one. Folks, they are telling you that we're looking for the missing link. I am telling you the chain is missing. The entire chain, when life first appears, it appears. Well, then what was beneath that? What you have is a tree without a trunk. 
and no limbs. The evolutionist cannot cross this. He's coming up now with weird theories because he had uh, uh, some idea that, that somehow he would be able uh, to find these transitional forms. But you say, Pastor, don't we see these in Time Life magazine? I mean, don't we see these half men, half apes? I mean, haven't we seen the pictures? Haven't we gone to the museums? Haven't we seen the plaster of Paris molds? Yes, you have seen them. But you haven't seen reality, you've seen imagination. The first Scopes trial that took place here in Tennessee is called the Monkey Trial in Dayton, Tennessee. William Jennings Bryan was versing, uh, versus Clarence Darrow. Clarence Darrow was a brilliant man, a sort of a, I guess, a skeptical lawyer. William Jennings Bryan was a golden-tongued orator and a Bible believer. And Darrow, trying to prove evolution as a fact, brought up in that, uh, in that uh, court trial the Nebraska man. And he asked uh, William Jennings Bryan, how do you explain Nebraska man? Nebraska man was discovered by a man named uh, Harold Cook. Nebraska man was said to be one million years old. And there was Clarence Darrow, saying to William Jennings Bryan, there is Nebraska man, there is your ape man. Well, what had Mr. Cook discovered? Are you ready for this? A tooth. I said, a tooth. And out of a tooth, an artist devised a race, both male and female. As a matter of fact, a creationist visited the University of Nebraska uh, where, where they, they have uh, Nebraska man on display. He went into their museum and he said, oh, he said, this is wonderful. Of course, he, it was tongue in cheek. Uh, there they had the skull and the skeleton of Nebraska man. And this man uh, mischievously asked, I, is this the real Nebraska man or only a replica? Oh, he said, this is only a replica. He said, well, would you tell me where are the actual bones of Nebraska man so I may go see the actual bones of Nebraska man? He says, well, we don't, we don't have the bones. These are our plaster Paris replicas. He says, yes, I understand that, but what are they replicas of? Where can I, I go? You must have had the bones in order to make this replica, to make this cast. And the curator had to drop his head and say, well, all we had was a tooth. One tooth. And with a tooth, they made the head, the body, they glued on some hair, and then they made a whole civilization out of one tooth. What about the Java ape man? Dr. Eugene Du Bois found in Java the top of a skull, the fragment of a left thigh bone, and three teeth. He, amount, he announced he found the missing link 7, uh, 750,000 years old. These bones weren't even found together. They were found over a space of a year, and eminent scientists, 24 of them, were brought together to look. Ten said that they were the bones of an ape. Seven said they were the bones of a man, and the seven said they were a missing link, that is half man and half ape. But you go to the museum, he's uh, Pithecanthropus erectus, the ape man who stands up. He's just an ape. You know, it's amazing how man wants to make a monkey of himself, isn't it? <laughs> amazing. And the Piltdown Man. When I was in college, we studied the Piltdown Man as a fact because Charles Dawson in Piltdown, England, found in a gravel pit a piece of a jaw, two molar teeth, and a piece of a skull. For 50 years, he was known as the Piltdown Man, but later on, it was shown to be a hoax, and even the Reader's Digest said in 1956, the great Piltdown hoax was an ape only 50 years old. Its teeth had been filed down and artificially colored. Now, I'm telling you, this is what the scientists looked at. This is what they studied. It was a hoax played by a student on his professor. A hoax. Well, you say anybody can be misled. Yes, but what I'm trying to show you is how easily these great scientists can be misled. What I'm trying to show you is how willingly they are misled. 
a leading, well-known biologist of the Smithsonian Institute said this, there is no evidence which would show man developing step by step from lower forms of life. There is nothing to show that man was in any way connected with monkeys. He appeared suddenly and substantially in the same form as he is today. There are no such things as missing links. So far as concern the major groups of animals, the creationists appear to have the best argument. There is not the slightest evidence that any one of the major groups arose from any other. Hey, folks, it's an argument without evidence. It's the, it's, it's the fixity of the species. Now, here's a third bridge in which they, they can't cross. The first one is, is the beginning of life. The second is the fixity of the species. The third one is the second law of thermodynamics. Now, what is the second law of thermodynamics? The second law of thermodynamics is this, that energy can never be destroyed, but it continually becomes less available for further work as it unravels. In plain English, everything tends to wear out and to run down. Have you found that out? Sure. I mean, everything tends to wear out and run down. A garden, leave a garden by itself. Is it going to get to be a better garden? Of course not. Your car. You drive your car out into the woods and leave it out there and just park it. And I'll tell you what will happen. The second law of thermodynamics will begin to work on that car and the mossy fingers of time and rust will begin to work on that thing and it will disintegrate. Or just go take a look in your boy's bedroom if you don't believe this. <laughs> what I'm telling you is that everything is marked by death and decay and disintegration. Why would a God who created everything make it that way? Because of sin. The Bible says in Romans 8 verse 22, we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. There's a curse upon creation and it tends to wind down. The evolutionist, however, has to say that things get more complex. Things move toward precision, given enough time Disorganized things become organized. Frankly, that doesn't make sense. If you were to take a 747 and load in the, in the uh, cargo bay the parts of a Cadillac automobile and climb to 5,000 feet and shove them out, would you think that they would assemble themselves into a car by the time they hit the ground? Well, the evolutionist says, of course not. You need more time. You need more time. You need more time. Okay, let's take the airplane up to 20,000 feet and then shove them out. Then are they going to be more assembled? They're going to be less assembled than ever. You see, the longer it goes, the more disintegration you have. I wish I had more time to talk about that, but let me tell you the fourth bridge that they cannot cross. They cannot explain how certain properties exist that have nothing to do with the survival of the fittest. Where did music come from? What does that have to do with the survival of the fittest? Where did love come from? Where did honor and dignity come from? Where, my dear friend, did we get the concept of Almighty God? Where did these things come from? You can't explain those by the survival of the fittest. Now, I want to say I, I reject it for logical reasons. Let me tell you another reason I reject it. I reject it not only for logical reasons, but I reject it for moral reasons. It's immoral. Folks, let me tell you something. When, when, when you tell young people that they are an accident, that they simply happen, what does that do? It takes away dignity, it takes away purpose, it takes away morality. Nietzsche and Darwin both hated their fathers. Nietzsche was a sexual pervert. He died of syphilis. He was the one who wrote Man and Superman. Hitler read Darwin. Hitler read Nietzsche. Hitler wrote Mein Kampf. Hitler was the one who fired up the gas ovens. Together, Hitler and Stalin, who believe that man is merely an animal, put to death 57 million people. Why? He's an animal. He's disposable. 
Here's a quote by Darwin that you'll very seldom hear. At some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. At the same time, the anthropomorphous, anthropomorphous apes will no doubt be exterminated. The break between man and it, when he says anthropomorphous apes, he means those, those people that you meet on the streets. I mean, he, he's talking about what he considers to be inferior races. What he considers to be, not what I consider to be. He says the anthropomorphous apes will no doubt be exterminated. The break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider, for it will intervene between man and a more civilized state, as we may hope, even the Caucasian and some ape as low as a baboon, instead of now between the Negro or Australian and the gorilla. Now, I wonder what our precious black friends would say about Mr. Darwin now. What, what he, he, he was the original racist. He's saying that there is a superior race of men and some others are on their way up, but they haven't arrived where we are today. You can understand why Hitler said, I have the right to exterminate an inferior race that breeds like vermin. He was talking about the Jews. You see, if there is no God, if man is an incident, an accident, there can be no Ten Commandments. There is no fixed standard of right and wrong. Therefore, children are sent to school to study values clarification, to make up their own minds what kind of values they, the little animals, have. No wonder we have euthanasia today. No wonder we're killing little babies in the womb and even partially born today. No wonder sexual perversion is accepted as an alternate lifestyle. Why? Because we've taught our children that they've come from animals and now they've finally begun to live like and act like animals. I reject it for moral reasons. Folks, I want to tell you I reject it for theological reasons. H.G. Wells, who wrote the outlines of history, said this, he was an evolutionist, I believe. He said, if all animals and man evolved, then there were no first parents, no paradise, no fall. And if there had been no fall, then the entire historic fabric of Christianity, the story of the first sin and the reason for the atonement, collapses like a house of cards. You see, listen, if evolution is true, there was no Garden of Eden. There was no original sin. There is no depravity. Man is always onward, upward, going up. Then he doesn't need to be born again. He doesn't need a birth from above. He just needs a boost from below. He just needs to get better and better and better. And if, if, if Genesis 3 is a myth, John 3 is a farce that says you must be born again. I reject it for theological reasons. I wish I had more time to talk about this, but may I tell you that there's something behind this whole idea of evolution? Why? Why has it, is it such an emotional issue? Why can, we, why can we not just simply say, yes, you cannot have creation without a creator. Out of nothing, nothing comes. Why can we not say that? Listen to Algis Huxley. Leading humanist, listen to what he said in his book, Ends and Means, and this will clear it up. I had motives for not wanting the world to have a meaning. For myself, as no doubt for most of my contemporaries, the philosophy of meaninglessness was essentially an instrument of liberation. The liberation we desired was simultaneously liberation from a certain system of morality we objected to the morality because it interfered with our sexual freedom. We objected to the political and economic system because it was unjust. The supporters of these systems claimed that in some way 
They embodied the meaning, a Christian meaning, they insisted, of the world. There was one admirably simple method of confuting these people and at the same time justify ourselves in our political and erotic revolt. We could deny that the world had any meaning whatsoever. That's what he said. He said, we, we didn't want government, and we did not want morality. So we chose evolution to shut the mouths of those who believe in special creation. Time is gone. Listen to me. Young people, you listen to your pastor today. I'm going to tell you, you are not an accident. You are made in the image of God. And I'm going to tell you that you are precious to him. So precious to him that he sent his son, the Lord Jesus, to suffer, bleed, and die for you. He was buried. He rose again the third day. And he invites you to come to him. And the Bible says, if any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. Oh, he made the first world. He made it all. But oh, when you're saved, how wonderful. He made the first world with a word. But when he saves you, he does it with his precious blood. You're precious to him. You have dignity. You have a heavenly father who loves you and cares for you. And I stand here to tell you right now that if you do not trust him as your Lord and Savior, he is still your creator, and you'll rise in the judgment to meet him and to answer. And Sir Huxley and others cannot dodge, dodge the fact that there is a God that made us, we'll either re be redeemed by him or we'll face him in judgment, but we'll meet our creator someday. Let's bow in prayer. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Now, today, if you've not received Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, I want you to do so right now. And I want to tell you some wonderful news, that where you are this moment, you can be saved. I mean, right now, you can be saved. If you pray and ask Christ to come into your heart, would you pray like this? Thank you, Lord, that I am special. Thank you that you made me. And thank you, Lord, that you died for me. Lord, I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. My sins deserve judgment. But Jesus, you died to save me. You paid my sin debt with your blood on the cross. Thank you for taking my place. Thank you for being my substitute. I now receive you as my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart. Forgive my sin. Save me, Lord Jesus. Would you pray that prayer? Come into my heart. Forgive my sin. Save me, Lord Jesus. Did you ask him? Then I want you to pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you for saving me. Begin now to make me the person you want me to be. And Lord, give me the courage to make this public and not to be ashamed of you. Ask him that. Lord, give me the courage to make it public, not to be ashamed of you. In your name I pray. Amen. A wonderful promise in God's Word is given by the Lord Jesus Christ who said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice, and open the door. I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. That means that Jesus Christ is knocking at the heart's door. We have to open the door. He'll not break it down. But if we will open the door, Jesus Christ will come in and fellowship with us. We call that being saved. That means that every sin is forgiven. It means that Jesus Christ lives in our heart as a bright, shining, burning reality. And it means that one day when Jesus comes again or when we die, he'll take us home to heaven to be with him. Would you like to receive him? Pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner and I'm lost. I need to be saved. 
You shed your blood on that cross to save me. You promised to save me if I would trust you, and I do trust you. Tell him that. I do trust you now, today, forever. Take control of my life. I give it over to you. Pray it and mean it. And if you do write to us and let us know, we'll rejoice and we'll send you some literature to help you to get started in your Christian life. We hope that today's message has been an encouragement to you. For more resources from Adrian Rogers, including copies or downloads of this message, as well as Pastor Rogers' outline, notes, or a complete transcript, please visit our website at lwf.org. At lwf.org, you can also sign up to receive daily devotionals from Adrian Rogers delivered directly to your computer or mobile device each morning. And if you would like to learn more about who Jesus is, we hope you'll visit the Discover Jesus link on our homepage. Or if you're looking for some inspiration or encouragement to get you through the week, check out our social media at LWF Ministries. Join us next time as Adrian Rogers brings us more profound truth, simply stated, with another powerful message from God's Word. Thanks for joining us for today's program. We'll see you next time. Love Worth Finding is a viewer-supported ministry and is a thank you for your gift this month. We want to send you the Walk by Faith booklet collection from Adrian Rogers. Learn what authentic faith really is and enjoy victory in your Christian life. The bundle includes five powerful booklets taken from some of Adrian Rogers' most popular messages. The Walk by Faith booklet collection is yours this month for a gift of any amount. Call 1-800-647-9400 or find us online at lwf.org. At our website, you'll see the newest book from Love Worth Finding, Discover Jesus, available through our online store. Who is Jesus? How can I know him? Learn the answers through the book, Discover Jesus at lwf.org.